So um, if I was going to ask you to name a piece of equipment that's commonly found in a biology laboratory, you probably wouldn't say spectrophotometer, pipetter, incubator, orbital shaker, or centrifuge. You'd probably say a microscope. And when you said microscope, you'd be referring to a, a compound light microscope, probably bright field. Now, there are very versatile instruments and uh, we do use them a lot. It's probably the most versatile instrument that we have in a biology laboratory. Uh, I kind of wish I had one that looks like this, um, but I'd keep it in my office most of the time. You notice that there's a single eyepiece up at the top. The stage looks awfully complicated, and it's had a tiny little objective lens. Modern compound light microscopes are wonderful instruments. This one I have here, for example, can see anything that's living, any living specimen at all, no matter how tiny. The features of a compound microscope start with a, an illuminator. You have to have a light source. <clears throat> this one has a built-in illuminator with an intensity control so that the light comes up through a, an opening in the base. We have on here a daylight filter. It takes the yellow out of the tungsten bulb and gives you a, a truer color image when you're looking at a stained specimen. Up here is an, a critical element in a compound microscope. It's called the condenser. Condenser has a lens in it that collects the light from the illuminator, focuses it on the specimen, usually has an apparatus for incorporating elements into the light path that give you specialized optics and allow you to optimize uh, the lighting for uh, contrast and resolution. There's a neat little apparatus in here called an aperture diaphragm that we use to control contrast and resolution, in fact. This one's on an adjustable rack. You don't need an adjustable rack. It's fine as is. Um, microscopes always have a stage, not always removable. This one is a mechanical stage. When you place a slide on this thing, it's clipped into place. And that's that. You don't have to touch it with your hands anymore. You have a couple of controls here that move the stage forward and back, left and right. It's nice and convenient. I wouldn't sacrifice a mechanical stage if I was going to go for lowering the expense. And most modern microscopes have what we call an objective turret. The objective turret contains uh, an assortment of objective lenses. Uh, on this one, they range from 40 power, I'm sorry, 4x, giving a final magnification of 40 power, 10 power, 40 power, and 100 power. Uh, so we have a range of final magnifications on this microscope, combined with our 10 power eyepieces, that is, of 40 all the way up to 1,000. Finally, up at the top, and notice all these components are removable. Uh, compound microscopes are generally modular in design. You mix and match. The stand is very basic, and you buy whatever components you want to get the kinds of optics that you'd like to have. Uh, this binocular eyepiece tube is wonderful. They operate just like binoculars. Uh, and the principle behind using one of these is that two eyes are better than one. You hear about people taking their binoculars to go bird watching. They don't take a monocular to go bird watching. You can really see detail with use both eyes at the same time, and you can even see depth. Uh, in this case, the eyepieces are individually adjustable, so unless you have astigmatism, you don't even need to wear your eyeglasses. You can adjust these things for eye separation, uh, just like you do a regular pair of binoculars. This is, by the way, a storage position for the microscope. Mm -hmm. There we go. If we want to put the microscope in a working position, we arrange it like this, and it's used just the way it is. If you'd be sitting there opposite me, looking through the eyepieces and working with the stays just like this. Before I start talking about bright field microscopy and the principles, uh, I need to talk a little bit about the properties of light and light conducting media and the property of refraction. Uh, if light, well, let's say the speed of light in a vacuum is the fastest velocity uh, that, is, that we know of in the known universe. If light, despite that, that speed, if light strikes a medium such as air, water, glass, it slows down. It's still faster than anything else in that medium, but it does indeed slow down. If it strikes 
a beam of light strikes a flat surface, it slows down and goes right through, continues straight on. On the other hand, if it strikes at an angle, light doesn't go straight through, it bends. And that principle is um, a mixed blessing. On the one hand, uh, different wavelengths of light refract at different angles, and they cause a problem with resolution. On the other hand, we can take advantage of refraction and we can design microscope lenses that cause light beams to be focused at a particular point, then expand it again to give us a magnified image. Uh, if you think about why light reflects, refracts, consider that light has a, a particle nature and a wave-like nature. You can picture it as a beam of particles that vibrate in the XY plane in every cross-section of a beam. As the particles strike a surface, they strike it as though they're a, a rod of light, you might say, or something that has dimension. Uh, just as a, a car going off a paved surface onto a soft shoulder will catch one tire and in turn, the light, the part of the light that strikes the, the surface, slows down first, causing the light beam to actually bend and uh, bend in a direction that's orthogonal to the surface that is perpendicular. So light slowing down, hitting a surface at an angle, bends toward the perpendicular line to the surface. On the other hand, if it exits uh, from a slow medium to a fast medium, it goes in the opposite direction, just as though you're driving off of a muddy shoulder back onto a paved road, then you go off at a sharper angle. That's why if you put a stick into a pool of clear water, it looks like it's broken. The light comes in, angles, and then it angles back, and it's displaced. Now, the property of refraction can be used to design a magnifying lens. I have a, an illustration here showing uh, a double convex lens, and that's the type that, does, that is used in an objective lens of a microscope. Uh, what happens there on a convex surface <laughs> is that, again, if light comes straight on, it passes straight through. If the light comes at an angle, it then angles uh, toward the perpendicular to the surface, which means that always when light strikes a convex surface, it, uh, it moves, uh, focuses more toward the middle of the lens. Upon exit, if this was a flat lens, light would move at a, more, a sharper, more acute angle away from the, the central um, perpendicular but this is a convex lens, and so when light exits from the slow medium to the fast, it actually moves again away from the perpendicular, this time takes it again toward the center. And so what we have, if we have light beams coming in at all angles toward a convex lens, if this is our lens sitting here, they strike the lens, are then focused so that a point beyond the lens, uh, they cross over and beyond that crossover point, they start to spread out again. And that's where we get our magnified image. If we were to take my hand, for example, and take the, the light from my tip of my finger, hits a convex lens, it's moved to the middle. When it exits the convex lens, it's moved again to the middle. From the heel of my hand, it goes in the other direction, again moves to the middle, and then again to the middle. All of the points that are visible in the plane of my hand eventually cross over in what we call a focal point, and then they spread out again. In a microscope objective lens, we have a convex lens like this. We have a number of lens elements, as a matter of fact, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, and those lens elements combine to give us a very, very high resolution projected image, which, in addition to the condenser, is a, is a critical element of a compound microscope. Now, there is a consequence of having biconcave lenses. If um, you place an arrow, for example, it's the, the typical uh, uh, demonstration that, that's used, or the letter E is frequently used, as a matter of fact. Uh, if you place uh, something asymmetrical in the light path, uh, then the double convex lens, by nature of the crossover, uh, inverts the image, that is, what is right side up becomes upside down, and it also reverses it from left to right. So the letter E, for example, would be upside down and flipped as though it was an upside down mirror image. 
Uh, if that isn't confusing enough, when you use your mechanical stage, if you move the stage to your left, <laughs> uh, it will appear through the eyepieces as though it's moving to the right. If you move it to the left, uh, to the right, it appears that it's going left. Forward appears to be going down, and, and uh, toward you appears to be going away from you. You'll get used to it after a while. Uh, besides contrast, uh, the other major problem that we encounter when we try to view objects in a microscope is resolution. Uh, and that's why these microscopes are designed with complex objective lenses. Uh, even with uh, these, uh, an objective lens of very, very good design, there's a limit to resolution. The theoretical limit is about 0 0.2 micrometers, uh, which is uh, two ten thousandths of a, of a millimeter. Uh, pretty tiny. Uh, nevertheless, uh, bacteria uh, might be as, uh, as small in diameter as a half a micrometer. Uh, when we try to make measurements with a microscope, we might think we have more precision than we do. Uh, the slide here shows a scale. Uh, the upper one is actually how it would look if we had perfect resolution. If you could see this thing in a, an electron magne uh, microscope, for example. The bottom uh, illustration is actually what the scale would look like uh, with a resolution of one micrometer. And that is really what most microscopes will give us. The theoretical limit is 0 0.2 micrometers, and that is under perfect conditions. Now, to get the optimum resolution from a microscope, then we need to combine an objective lens with a condenser. As I pointed out, the condenser and the objective lenses are two of the most important features of a compound microscope. The condenser isn't just for making images darker, or, and it's certainly not for adjusting uh, illumination. What it does is adjusts the angle at which the light enters the objective lens so that it matches the numerical aperture of the lens. I'm not going to get into any technical details about the formula for resolution, the relationship to refractive index and, and, and wavelength and all that. I'm not very good at that sort of thing anyway. Uh, but uh, it is important to note that the condenser must be adjusted for a particular objective lens if you're going to get good resolution. Otherwise, what you get is what we call empty magnification, the same as what you would get if you took a magnifying lens, made a great big one, and tried to magnify something 100 times or 200 times with a single simple lens. In empty magnification, we can uh, make the image larger and that's fine, but the image doesn't improve in resolution, and what we get is a blur. Uh, in the uh, example above at 40 power, <clears throat> with, um, which is about the limit of a dissecting microscope, we can get a pretty good image. It looks like there's a lot of detail there. We go up to 100 power by, let's say, taking an, uh, an eyepiece and making a uh, 25 power eyepiece instead of a 10 power eyepiece, and we could magnify that same image uh, to 100 power, final magnification. But we wouldn't gain anything. We wouldn't see any more detail than we did at the lower magnification. All we would do is magnify a blur. Uh, at 400 power, forget it. Uh, it isn't even worth looking. On the other hand, with the objective lenses, in combination with eyepieces, what we do is get very, very good resolution. We magnify with the eyepiece a high resolution image, and even at a, a thousand power, we would see a, uh, an image <coughs> that looks very much like the one pictured here at 400 times from the bottom. Uh, very high detail uh, and uh, good contrast, too, I might add. Now, the next thing I need to talk about is called depth of focus. Uh, when we look for something in a microscope, we're thinking, okay, we need to move the stage around. This thing is over there in the corner someplace. Let's, let's give it a look. Well, that's all well and good uh, if uh, you're in the focal plane, if your objective lens will see the object when you get to it. Chances are it's going to be above or below what we call the focal plane of the specimen. Uh, you have to consider that uh, your, your specimen is present in a three-dimensional space uh, and your objective lens is limited as to the space uh, in which it can focus on an object. If you're above, let's say I have the stage lowered, 
so that the specimen is well below the objective lens, then the space that we're looking at is up here above the stage someplace. If I have the stage raised, we're looking down into the stage someplace and we don't see the specimen at all. Because these I, uh, objective lenses are designed to focus very clearly and produce high resolution images. If we're very far from the specimen, we don't see much but maybe a, a very, very slight blur. It's almost invisible. If we were to take a very tiny object, a bacterium or maybe, uh, maybe even just a small protist and place it on the stage, if we're much above or below the focal plane, we can't see it. So it's critical then that we keep in mind that there is a, a volume of space in which, uh, at which we are, are viewing uh, the specimen with each objective lens, and that to find something, we've got to look not only in the XY plane, but we've got to look up and down as well. Uh, for that reason, it, it is best to start, unless you really, really know your specimen very well, with the lowest magnification and work your way up. So what I do is I would take the 4x lens on this microscope, which in combination with the 10 power eyepiece gives us 40 power. That's the lowest magnification on the scope. And with this lens, uh, we can see a disc uh, that is 5 millimeters in diameter, about 160 micrometers in, in depth. That's a little less than two tenths of a millimeter. It sounds small, but relative to the space between a cover slip and a slide, that's a huge distance. We can see everything as long as we can recognize it. Now, something like a bacterium is going to be very, very small at 40 power. Nevertheless, we start there. We try to recognize the focal plane, and then we can start working up in magnification and start searching for the specimens we want to find. We rotate in a 10 power lens. We have a 100 power magnification. If we focus then and center up our specimen, uh, then we can go ahead and work our way up. Notice that the volume in which we're viewing the specimen with a 10x lens is two and a half times smaller in area than uh, with a 40x lens and much, much shallower, something like 40 micrometers deep. Uh, and so the volume is really uh, tremendously reduced. Uh, at, uh, with a 40x lens, we're now at 400 power. Now we can start to see things like bacteria, protists very well, some details provided we have the right kind of optics. Uh, but the area is, is small and the depth of focus is wafer th actually less than wafer thin. Uh, it's incredibly close so that a few turns of the fine focus knob on the microscope and you're going to be completely out of the plane. You won't be able to see a thing. Uh, with uh, the tiniest specimens, particularly with bacteria, stained bacteria, we need to use a 1,000 power lens, uh, usually with immersion oil, something I'll talk about in a bit. And when we focus, we have such a narrow focal plane that a partial turn of the fine focus and we're going to disappear completely. We'll be hopelessly out of the focal plane and we won't be able to find it again. So it's depth of focus, not so much the um, XY plane that, that gives us a headache when we try to find small specimens. The trick is, in fact, to start at low magnification, focus on the specimen or on the surface of the slide if necessary, if you can't find the specimen. Center it up with your mechanical stage. Work your way up in magnification. Again, focus. Again, center up your specimen and continue to work up to the highest magnification that you require, and then go ahead and make your observations. By the way, in a well-designed microscope, most of the objective lens are what we call parfocal. That means that when you're in focus with one magnification and you switch lenses, you're going to be very, very close to, the, uh, to focus with the, with the next magnification. Uh, so you won't need to go and research uh, and, and search the whole vertical distance for a specimen. You'll be very, very close and a few nudges up and down and you'll be back into focus again. I can't stress how important it is to consider depth of focus when you're trying to find an object in a microscope. It might be very easy to see it in a field. In fact, it might be there in your microscope field. But if your lens is way above or way below the focal plane of the specimen, 
you're not going to see anything. If you try to start at too high a magnification and focus on a specimen and, and search for it, your chances are you're not going to have a, a, a prayer of finding it. Now, just to illustrate that concept, just to give you a handle on what depth of focus means, I'm going to get small for you right now. Let's pretend that I'm a, a centimeter tall and I'm standing on top of your microscope stage. Okay, so I'm standing there on your stage and you're looking down at me with your 4x objective lens. You have, you're magnifying me 40 times and trying to see me standing on your stage. Well, I'm a centimeter tall. I'm kind of tall. I don't transmit light very well. But even if I could, uh, I would not be in focus for you at any particular level. Part of me would be out of focus at any given time. In fact, most of me would be out of focus. You could see the top of my head. You could see the bridge of my nose. You could see my belt buckle, perhaps. The rest of me would be obscuring your view because it's completely out. Finding me wouldn't be a problem. I'm standing on your stage. You've got your mechanical controls. You move it around, and this is the surface area in which you have to look proportional to me. In real world, it's five millimeters in diameter. Uh, in mine, uh, this thing is almost a meter in diameter. So you've got a huge area in which to look. But when it comes to focusing, this is the volume of space in which you're looking. Large area, very, very narrow depth. Uh, and so at wherever your objective lens is, this is the volume of space that's into focus or close to being in focus. This is the stuff you can see. And you can see with an object like me, there's no point in even using a microscope. I'm just too blasted big. On the other hand, let's suppose we take one of my hairs here, a gray one, and we plunk it down in the middle of the field. Now, my hairs are 60 micrometers in diameter, roughly. Uh, the, the gray ones, that is. Uh, at, uh, in your world, being big, my, one of my hairs, if I was one centimeter tall, would be about the diameter of a bacterial cell. I'm going to turn this thing up here. Can you see the hair? Probably not. And the same is true in a microscope. If you're looking at 40 power at a bacterial cell that isn't stained at all, uh, you're not going to see anything there uh, unless you have specialized optics. Uh, on the other hand, we could stain the material. And even if we stain it, especially if it's a gram-negative cell, it's, it's going to be rather faint, not much contrast because it's so blasted tiny. And look, it's occupying a very, very tiny region of space here. You've got this huge field. Uh, what we need to do then uh, to locate that particular object is use some of the strategies I showed you for uh, finding an object, finding the focal plane, rather, uh, of the specimen to start with. You've got to get your, your uh, lens adjusted, the focus adjusted, so that you know that this bacterial cell or this group of cells you're looking for is there in the volume of space in which you're trying to look. To do that, you'll look at a scratch perhaps on the lens or on the, on the slide. You perhaps might have a mark on the slide. If you have a dense smear of bacteria, you might, it might look like dirt and you can sort of uh, focus on that. But you've got to get it focused and you have to use low magnification to optimize your depth of focus. This is the thickest depth of focus you're going to get with this microscope. It's downhill after that. So you get into your focal plane, find the region in which you can locate your specimen, center it on up, and now it's time to move up in magnification. Let's go to 100 power. I'm still a centimeter tall, of course, and I lost my hair, so here's another one. Okay, here's your surface area now. We're looking at a, about a foot in diameter, maybe a little more. Uh, for you, it's about two millimeters of surface area. That's a very generous amount for a microscope, but Here's your depth of focus now with this higher magnification lens. It's about a quarter of an inch, seven millimeters. It's a lot, lot thinner than it was before. If you hadn't found a roughed into the focal plane at low magnification and you tried to go straight to this higher one, 100 power, you'd have an awful time getting into the correct focal plane. Uh, you'd have to struggle a little more to get the right up and down. Uh, and uh, with the smaller area, you're looking at a smaller region of the slide. And so finding the area in which you're interested in, 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 in where your specimen is lying 
It might be a little more tricky. You've got to look through more slide in order to get to it. So uh, let's say that you started at 40 power and you found the area in which the cells are likely to be. You got into the focal plane, probably looking at scratches on the slide or something of that sort. And now you move up into magnification. And 100 power, you might be able to see the bacteria if they're well stained, if there's some contrast. You might have to increase the aperture diaphragm, stop it down, uh, and increase your contrast to really see the stuff. And then you can optimize contrast later. OK, so we center up the area of interest. And we get into the focal plane, which again is, is very, very narrow right now. And now I'm going to rescue my hair this time. There we go. Now we, we need to move up in magnification. On my scope, uh, the next highest magnification final is 400 power. Uh, you might recognize a CD-ROM disc. These are two that are taped together. That's the thickness of your depth of focus right now, uh, with proportional to me, that is. Uh, for you, the depth of focus is about 12 micrometers. That's very teensy. Uh, it's less, much less, than the diameter of one of my hairs. If you can get close to the depth of focus now, uh, you'll be there um, looking at, um, oh, one of my hairs, yeah, but not a bacteria. And bacterial cells tend to be about a half a micrometer in diameter. Uh, so uh, within this 12 micrometers deep volume of space, and here's the diameter of the volume. It's, uh, what, four and a half inches, something like that. Within this volume of space, uh, you're searching, again, uh, for that half a micrometer in diameter cell. And if you're not roughly focused at this time, you're not even, your volume of space is going to be outside where that cell is. We've got to get it lined up. So uh, thusly, we have to not only center up, the specimen, but we've also got to adjust the focus with each step in magnification. Now you're looking at this narrow volume, uh, very narrow depth. We get focused and centered. At 400 power, you can probably see the cell now with contrast adjusted pretty well. You might even be able to distinguish the gram stain characteristic. You might be able to distinguish cell shape to some extent. Now we're pretty good, but to really get some good observations on this thing, we've got to go up one more level of magnification. Uh, again, with, with bacterial specimens, we've got to use oil immersion. Anything very, very tiny benefits from using oil immersion microscopy, very high magnifications. So again, we focus, we center it up, and now we go to our next level of magnification. Here you are. Here's your diameter of the field of view. Here's the, the focal distance. All right, this is literally it. It's about a millimeter deep. That's for me. I'm one centimeter tall standing on your stage, and you're looking for something in this little tiny area. For you, this is about a tenth of a, two tenths of a millimeter diameter. It's about five micrometers deep. Now, consider originally that you're at low magnification, your depth of focus was about uh, uh, an inch and a quarter, an inch and a half, okay? Which was really is really 200 micrometers to you. And consider that your specimen could be many, many hundreds of micrometers away from that volume of space in which your lens was looking. Can you imagine if you started off with a 100 power lens and here's the volume of space that you can see with a 100 power lens, your specimen could be here and you're searching, 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 trying to find this thing up and down uh, slowly. You know how long it takes to go that distance? It takes forever. Plus, if your specimen's over here, you're searching the whole slide. You're searching in three dimensions for this thing. It's fruitless to try to find something at very, very high magnification, uh, starting off at high magnification without some strategy for working your way up and looking. Uh, once you've got it uh, centered and focused at each step, then it's a rather small matter. It does take some skill to get focused and centered at the magnification you want. And then you've got your object right there. Now, uh, there's something important to keep in mind that when you're viewing at very, very low power, you're viewing an area of specimen uh, that um, is quite large. And the amount of light reaching your eye is also quite large. Think about it. When you look through an eyepiece, you see the same apparent size or apparent field of view uh, every time you look in the eyepiece, no matter what the magnification. Well, if all the light 
is coming in from a, a five millimeter wide area, a diameter circle, you're getting a lot of light coming up to your eye and you'll have to turn down the intensity a little bit if you've got a really good illuminator or else it'll hurt your eyes. On the other hand, if you work your way up to a 40 power objective lens, now you're looking at an area that's quite small. A lot less light is coming up to your eye, a couple of orders of magnitude less as a matter of fact. And you're going to have to brighten up the illuminator quite a bit or it's going to be too dim. Now, in addition to resolution, the other thing that a light microscope contributes that a dissecting microscope uh, or a, a magnifying lens can't is contrast. And again, our condenser is critical to optimizing contrast. Uh, if you have uh, something like a living specimen such as paramecium or an amoeba or perhaps uh, a protist, a very small protist, uh, such as uh, Chlamydomonas, for example. Um, they're very, very small. They don't have a lot of, uh, well, except for Chlamydomonas, they don't have a lot of pigmentation. Uh, and uh, in order to see them at all, you have to find some way of enhancing the contrast between the, um, the object itself and the background. In bright field, we have a white background and colorless objects, particularly living objects, can be washed out. So we use the condenser. This one has a neat little turret so we can put different kinds of optics in place. And on a good condenser, just about any condenser, there's a little thumb wheel or a lever or something that operates what we call an aperture diaphragm. That aperture diaphragm, if cranked down, uh, will give us uh, extremely high contrast. If opened up wide, will give us very low contrast. I'm going to talk in more detail about the condenser uh, in a little while, too. What we want to do with objective lenses is optimize uh, our contrast uh, with the compound microscope. What we want to do is make sure that we have just enough contrast to see detail, but not so much contrast that we distort the image. If you crank it down too far, you get something like the image on the right, uh, where you even see double images sometimes. Uh, on the far left, you notice that it's kind of low. You don't see a lot of detail. But we can see some fairly good views of the organelles of the paramecium under optimum contrast. Uh, with something like um, an amoeba, a very large amoeba, which uh, only the large ones can be seen in a, a bright field microscope in the first place, uh, we might have to really crank down the contrast and, and over contrast in order to see it at all. That's where, again, specialized optics are preferable.